All right, welcome to Simply Bitcoin. We break down the news from Twitter, the daily fail, the meme review, software releases, and the websites by plebs or plebs. Today, we've got very special guests, Stacy Herbert and Max Kaiser of the Orange Pill Podcast. But first, we're going to the numbers. Let's do it. Number time. At the time of this recording, the block height is 688,115. The Bitcoin price, 35,625. Chain rewrite days, 821, or even up from yesterday. Total lightning capa uh, total public lightning capacity, excuse me, 1,561.23. I think that's an all-time high. Bitcoin versus gold market cap, 5.82%. And the sats per dollar, unfortunately climbing, 2,803. Dude, I know we went down, but I'm feeling super <laughs> bullish because lightning capacity keeps going up. The fundamentals keep getting stronger. El Salvador's announcement. So fuck the price. Keep stacking sats. But yeah. There was a great chat on uh, Twitter Spaces uh, this afternoon with uh, Chaz from Lightning Junkies, Evan Kaloudis, uh, you know, a whole bunch of people from, uh, you know, the, like in the lightning community. And they were just talking about, you know, how there's a whole grassroots community growing of people just you know, setting up channels, building nodes, and, you know, they're, they're essentially building like a giant ring, you know? Dude, super, super bullish. But anyways, Phil, it's time for the daily fail. All right. This fail I've been hanging on to for a while, and we are going with, we, we've actually dumped on him in the, in the past, but he just has these god-awful takes. He, he's just, all right, here we go. We're talking about Jason uh, Calacanis. I, I can't pronounce his name right. I just tried before we started. Anyways, here we go. My thoughts on Bitcoin toxicity and maximalism on display. Uh, I guess he meant to say at Miami, but he said on Miami and how damaging and cult like it is for the project. Yeah. Yeah. Supporters are really damaging for a project. I hate supporters. All right. Stephen Cole, though, chimed in. You own Bitcoin, yet you talk shit about it because that gives you a way to look smart and right no matter what. Bitcoin wins. Told you so. Look at my BTC stash. Bitcoin has problems. Told you so. Look at my tweets. Kind of a bitch strategy, to be honest. And then, you know, Stephen goes on to tell him to sell. And then the icing on this cake is just this absolute cringe, cringe take, which thank you to... Uh, to Pedro, right, for, for hooking us up, Meme Lord Pedro. Let's uh, let's take a quick listen to this. A problem. All right, listen, we're at 75 minutes. Do we want to talk about toxic Bitcoin insanity in Miami? Yeah, what do we the hell is Cry that? harder. What are these guys doing? All right, so very simple. That guy got there dumped. Was a Bitcoin conference in Miami. <laughs> if you go to that conference, you have to agree to not mention other cryptocurrencies. There is a, we all have heard of Bitcoin maximalization or being a Bitcoin maximalist. This means you believe that Bitcoin is the one true cryptocurrency. All other cryptocurrencies do not exist. This conference has codified they don't. that. <laughs> to the point at which people are jumping on stage like maniacs, ripping off their clothes to reveal Dogecoin shirts. And then people are saying, Bitcoin maximalism now has evolved into Bitcoin toxicity, which is a subset of the Bitcoin movement. What Bitcoin toxicity says is in order for Bitcoin to become the one true currency and the reserve currency, we must attack anybody who attacks it. In other words, cult-like behavior, either accept Muhammad, Jesus, Moses, whoever, Hindi, Hindu God, <laughs> Zeus for the Greeks, you have to accept our God or else we're going to attack you. So you can actually see this in practice. I tweeted, if a if Bitcoin was replaced by technology, what would that look like? And you get massively ratioed on Twitter, which means more comments than likes. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take the other side of this if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Well, well anyway, so Bitcoin. Okay, we're, we're just going to stop it right there because all we really wanted was his take, his god awful take. <laughs> so I, I just want to say, uh, Max, how does it feel to be partially responsible for that video? <laughs> Great. <laughs> I, can, I can't feel. I'm. I'm feeling. I'm. I, I feel so good about it that we're doing a fuck Elon and fuck Mark Cuban event in Austin, Texas, on July eighth. You're kind of following through on the on that on that on that uh, Miami uh, event and 
it's I think Jason Calcanis, who I've known for 25 years. I knew him when I was running the Hollywood Stock Exchange quite well. As a matter of fact, he featured me in his magazine a few times. He gets so many things wrong. Uh, basically, <laughs> um, the, the thing about Bitcoin is that it's the only purely decentralized project or coin out there, and it's getting more and more decentralized. Every single other project, you can make a case for it to being centralized in some way. Um, so that's a significant divide between Bitcoin and everything else. Uh, second of all, just look at the market. The market is telling us something. Uh, the hash rate is totally dominated by Bitcoin, and that'll continue to yes. be uh, the dominant in going forward. When a country like El Salvador makes Bitcoin legal tender, that's a big fuck you to all these other wannabe coins, right? Uh, they're they're not money. They'll never be money. Uh, they're they're not in the same ballpark. They're not in the same league. The big thing about Jason Calacanis, and this is what the split is all about, is that he's basically a Silicon Valley guy. He, mm -hmm. He's a VC Silicon Valley guy, and as um, Dan um, Held has explained very eloquently is that the VC guys and the Silicon Valley guys hate Bitcoin because there's there's nothing left to do with it. There's no tweaks. There's no, you know, aside from core upgrades every four years or stuff. So, it's not like in Silicon Valley, which is a very trendy developer led what's hot, what's not. And, you know, he's makes his bones. Jason Calacanis has positioned himself as a, you know, venture capitalist star. And he wrote a book about venture capitalists and he's very proud of his venture capital uh, achievements. And he's very tight with that community. And it's, it's it, you know, Bitcoin laughs at those people because it was able to spring into existence completely outside. You know, people talk about, hey, Bitcoin is outside the banking system and it's outside the nation state system. It's also outside the venture capital system and outside the Silicon Valley system. You know, mm -hmm. and, the, and just like Jamie Dimon hates Bitcoin, so does Jason Calacanis. He's not, <laughs> he, he's from a different era. He's part of a, he's part of a legacy system. When we talk about the legacy banking system, we can also talk about the legacy venture capital system of which he is mm -hmm. part of. And he's resisting uh, the emergence of Bitcoin. And so he he grabs the tropes and the easy uh, kind of smears that he can. Uh, there's nothing backing him up. He doesn't talk about the technology. He's never mentioned the technology once in all of his ugly screeds. He has no idea how the technology works. We can, do, you know, surmise from from this because he's never mentioned it. Uh, he aligns himself with other kind of half baked uh, smear mongers who don't who, who are not really making um comments that are that that are not easily dismissed i mean he's right up there with mark cuban or someone like this again they're just they're they're they miss the boat they're bitter and um we don't need them and so he, it's the last stand it's like he's making the last stand that he can and within a year or two you know his career will be done <laughs> I, I already I, done. I agree. I, and and Stacy, for you, okay, yeah. just to confirm, do you think he has a micro penis? I he definitely has a micro penis, and that's what I was gonna say. This is an important and obvious point. But you know, the other thing is, you know who is really, really nice and super polite and have really polite conferences? Uh, you know, the bankers that destroyed the world, mm -hmm. you know, who was super sociable, very popular with people, was Bernie Madoff. You know, who was super, super amazingly charming was um, uh, who was that guy that murdered a whole bunch of people? Uh, <laughs> you know, he was executed. Charles Manson? No, 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 no. no. The, the good, Jeffrey the Dahmer. Good, the, the, the good looking one that was executed in Florida. The good though. looking one. There was a really good looking one. Ted Bundy. Yeah, he was, that's uh, really yes. good looking and charming. And uh, he he like apparently charmed the ladies and they got into his car willingly. And that's essentially what you're doing when, you know, a lot of these VC backed tokens, uh, I'll say the polite word, um, you know, that they they need to be charming because they need to lure you in to get wrecked. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's it, it. So I, I see this, and and from from my perspective, guys, the only thing I known I've ever known my entire life, right, um, is Bitcoin, right. So like I see this as remnants of the fiat system, right. Um, when I see these people, 
So um, awesome. Thank you guys for your perspective. But anyways, Phil, it's time for the Daily Meme Review. All right, everybody. The meme for today is brought to us by a fellow plebe. You can go follow him at Little Prince JD. He responded to my tweet. I said the IMF and World Bank confirmed this week. We've been saying for years they don't care that half the world is unbanked and could benefit from Bitcoin. They pose as humanitarian financial institutions, but they are parasites. They actual the their actual priority is power and control. <laughs> and this fellow plebe responded with the IMF, World Bank, El Salvador. It's a cat with laser eyes, Bitcoin in a volcano. Awesome, awesome meme. Uh, and man, and because it was from a fellow plebe, I'm going to one up Max. OK, and that's very hard to do. He's ripped up tons of fiat on camera before, but I bet you he's never ripped a hundred trillion dollars. Wow. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> <laughs> so is that uh, a Zimbabwe? That is a Zimbabwe bill. <laughs> so it's a hundred trillion dollars of shit. Uh anyways, Phil, what are you gonna give it? All right, yeah, that was that was an epic meme. And and you know what? I think I am gonna go with I am gonna go with a paper seed backup from Mr. Quinn Solo. Oh yeah, okay. why not, huh? Good good score. Good score. Why what not? about what about you guys? What would you give that meme? Well, the cat, that cat meme, the underlying meme is probably my top three of all favorite memes of all time. So for that, I'm going to go stun my balls. Ah, very, very good score. Okay. Amazing. <laughs> what about you, Max? <laughs> yeah, I love that cat meme too. You know, it's great. And, um, you know, it resonates, you know, the IMF essentially has been reduced to a meme. Uh, this once great institution is being disintermediated by a bunch of people on, uh, you know, Bitcoin Beach, I guess it's called, in El Ponte. Mm. El Zonte. El Zonte, yeah. El Zonte. I give it uh, a, a, a Flatoshi Quackamoto. <laughs> oh! We've never okay. had one of those. Okay, I'm awesome. not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. I thought I was gonna have the best score, but I'm gonna <laughs> give it to Stacy. Okay, because sunning, <laughs> sunning your balls is the most important thing. Uh, but <laughs> especially uh, if you're a woman. <laughs> Well, and nowadays, yeah. nowadays uh, you never know. Uh, but, but anyways, Phil, it's time for it. The Daily News, sponsored by Crypto Cloaks. And all right, guys, we've been talking about this all week, but we got we have two legendary guests on to talk about it some more. Check this out. El Salvador makes Bitcoin legal tender. And of course, uh, Max, you had this amazing tweet, uh, which we talked about on yesterday's mm -hmm. uh, episode. Basically, the, the part that stood out to me, it said El Salvador made Bitcoin legal tender and is forcing the world to play by Bitcoin's rules. How's the world reacting? <laughs> the IMF, a couple days after they released this article with their propaganda arm, of course, the IMF sees risk after El Salvador makes Bitcoin legal tender. There's a bunch of hypocrisy on in here. It says crypto assets can pose significant risk and effective and effective regulatory measures are very important when dealing with them. You know, it's just completely hypocritical. And of course, you know, uh, the friendly World Bank says it could not assist El Salvador in Bitcoin. Uh, implementation it says while the government did approach us for assistance on Bitcoin, this is not something the World Bank can support given the environmental <laughs> and transparency shortcomings. Again, again, <laughs> just hypocrisy like crazy. I see this as kind of like the opening salvo, right? They're they're making their positions very clear. Uh, this is the beginning of the end for them. But uh, I want to get your guys' thoughts. Do you agree? You disagree? Disagree or agree with the World Bank and the IMF? No, Wait. I'm saying so like, do, do you like I see kind of see this as like the opening salvo of like mm -hmm. the inevitable clash between world uh, central banks and Bitcoin? Well, this is a pivotal moment that we'll see going forward because the, the game theory, the way the game theory is, there's now been a first mover. So we're going to see over the next weeks and months. History being made because decisions will have to be taken. And how do they respond to this? In, um, you know, when we went off the previous hard money of gold, the biggest superpower of America could take us off. Returning to even harder money, that one of the smallest economies in the world 
could bring us all back onto a hard money standard. And I think that's remarkable. And it shows you the power of Bitcoin versus even gold. Are you yeah, worried? Stacey, you know, earlier this year was saying and asking people, will the fiat dollar, which is celebrating 50 years of existence this summer, will it even last 50 years? Because mm -hmm. it was in the summer of 1971 that we went on this global experiment of purely fiat money. I would say that El Salvador's move is the end of the 50 year experiment of all fiat money, because now you have a country that's actually on a hard money standard again, except as, as Stacey was saying, it's harder than gold. So the era that Nixon started 1971 till this year is finished. We're entering a new era, number one. Number two, uh, to follow, you know, yeah, to follow up on what I was tweeting there, I've been thinking about it. it, it it's you got to think about, you know, the, the government essentially also made it the citizens you know, mandated their, the use of Bitcoin, which, which people were questioning to some degree. But what's what's being done here is no less than what the founding fathers of the United States did when they gave when we they gave the people the Bill of Rights and Constitution, which I have a copy of right here. So in other words, they're giving their people freedom. And I'm wearing my freedom shirt today. Freedom from fiat money enslavement. So that is, um, you know what happened to, in the America, freedom became the global culture, became the global world reserve currency. You know, people all over the world were basically, you know, American culture became world culture. Mm -hmm. You know, Hollywood culture became the world culture. Everywhere you go, we've lived all over the world. If you turn on the nightly news, half the news, no matter where you are in the world, is about the United States. If you turn on the nightly news here in America, 100% of the news is about the United States. We don't co mm. cover anybody else except to some propaganda, but not, you know, we don't, we don't <laughs> care, right? So Ethnocentrism. Now, now El Salvador is is the spark, is the shot heard around the world. Of now it's a new freedom, a new era of freedom with perfect money that's outside of the banking system and outside the nation state system. It's unstoppable, unconfiscatable. So, so now, as Stacey again was saying, you know, the game theory kicks in. Uh, apparently, uh, Guatemala and Paraguay are, are teed up to follow in the tracks of El Salvador. Uh, you've got Argentina clearly is, is a candidate for this. So all of Latin America, South America, up to Mexico could go Bitcoin standard. And uh, I mean, I, everyone was waiting to see which country was going to do this. You know, we've been talking about it for a couple of years. I call it the hash wars. You know, what country was going to fall and essentially not ban Bitcoin, but make it legal tender. And uh, the guesses were Iran because, you know, they got four and a half percent of the hash rate. And, you know, some other countries came up. Japan, uh, you know, I didn't have El Salvador on my scorecard. OK, fair enough. They pulled the trigger. And uh, now we're in a new era. We're in a new hard money era. It just started this this past couple of weeks. Awesome. I, I kind of want to pivot a little bit because I, I was listening to the Kaiser report uh, earlier on today and I heard something and I want to ask you guys about this. Uh, of course, uh, you guys know the, the Bitcoin conference. It was huge. This is the New York Times. Thousands of sent on Miami to glorify Bitcoin. It was the largest Bitcoin event in the world. Now, I know you guys have been going to this since 2011, um, if, if my ears didn't mistake in me. How, like, how different is it? Could you describe when you first started going to these things and how, how yeah. it's evolved now? Yeah, like we went, we were at the very first Bitcoin conference in Prague in 2011, and there was maybe 40 people there. And it was uh, completely uh, focused on the underlying technology. And the audience was completely developers, hackers, programmers. And I did. I got up and spoke a little bit about the monetary implications of it, as I did in the 2012 as well in London, which was the next bigger conference that came up the following year. But, you know, it's gone through this, it, you know, Bitcoin attracts attackers. So we went through the block size wars. We've gone through, now we're going through the Elon Musk, you know, attacks and things like this now the world bank and the imf are attacking it so it attracts all these different attacks but i would say the biggest difference between the two you know now you've got you know almost like a woodstock like fervor in the miami conference where suddenly almost fifty thousand people showed up and um it's become a cultural zeitgeist right so it's becoming magazine is becoming like the new rolling stone magazine 
So it's covering really the, the underlying <laughs> zeitgeist. And all the other all the other shit coins are like emerging as shit bands, you know, that you would you wouldn't follow, you know, back in the 60s or 70s, you wouldn't follow the shit bands. You only followed the, the main bands. And uh, only Bitcoin is really providing the the kind of satisfaction that uh, you couldn't get enough satisfaction without it. What, what would you say? I would also say um, a few things. First of all, like this sort of perception that Jason Calcanis is expressing when they first emerge or they first witness or see all, all these mainstream media, New York Times, when they see uh, Bitcoiners. Uh, all your models are broken, right? Like this is, these are revolutionaries and we haven't seen revolutionaries in the West since the time of the French Revolution or the American Revolution. So, you know, there, and say the Black Panthers, you know, there, it's been a long time since we've seen revolutionary movements. And at that first event, Max and I had been covering financial news. We had been going to some gold conferences in the lead up to that. And then suddenly, <laughs> you know, you're at a conference with all these hackers, lots of guys on the spectrum who were like coding this and, you know, creating Bitcoin and maybe a little bit of difficulty communicating <laughs> with other human beings. So it was just like, oh, my God, Max and I had already been, you know, we were kind of the most prominent people in media. There weren't very many people in media covering it at the time. So we had been covering it for about um eight or nine months at that point when this first conference happened and we arrived there and we were like, oh my God, when we went back to our hotel room, who the fuck are these people? <laughs> <laughs> but also like that, that's important. Like at that time, you know, Bitcoin had gone from like a dollar up to $32 down back below a dollar at that point. So uh, nobody like, there wasn't like a depression. People didn't feel like emotional about it because it was like, it was, like a, a $25 million asset. Nobody cared, right? But um, that was still in the discovery stage. That, that was the infancy of Bitcoin. So it, it wasn't as whole. It hadn't revealed all that it was at that point to the participants. We were all standing around basically like a Mona Lisa and not understanding that we had a masterpiece. Like maybe a few people like Hal Finney understood <laughs> what it would one day be. But the community at large, like it was more like magic internet money and like, what is this thing? And, you know, it well, yeah. And the community has always been in conflict and it's really a holdover from, you know, I was running a dot com in the 1990s, you know, online flame wars are germane to online life and that's carried over into Bitcoin. And so from day one, there was always tribalism. There was always <laughs> warfare and, and it's still going on today. And uh, a lot of people get chewed up by it. You know, we had a couple of influencers uh, got beaten the shit out of them this past week. <laughs> um, you know, and this happens every few months as well. Uh, you know, the, the number of people we've seen come and go, a couple of them have died. Uh, some of them disappear. Some of them are in jail. Um, you know, some of them, um, you know, that, that we've seen that as well. So, but I, I think that culturally there's a Bitcoin aesthetic and a Bitcoin cultural zeitgeist movement that's happening mm -hmm. that it is like the new york times and the washington post it's like it's like you know it's like elvis presley would appear on a lawrence welk show you know the people who watch lawrence welk would be i can't believe he's shaking his hips i can't believe he's so overtly sexual you know this can't last it's 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 challenging our values but it was the beginning of a major cultural revolution of rock and roll, the sexual revolution, drugs in America. Mm. Okay, so like when I'm on stage uh, in Miami, I'm like, I'm Elvis Presley in this situation, and you're Lawrence Welk, New York Times. Like <laughs> you're looking, you're trying to like look at me as if I'm supposed to come out here and play the accordion and play some polka music. <laughs> no, we're we're fucking you up the ass in public <laughs> every day because your money is shit, and we're drawing a crowd. Okay. <laughs> So who's who's and, and by the way, I've been owning this thing for 10 years since a dollar. Who is fucking who? That's my question. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm pretty confident what the answer is. So this is the year that, uh, you know, things are going to get wilder and wilder. Are you not entertained? Max, 
Yeah. We, you've been saying this for I don't know how long. We completely agree with you. We also believe that Bitcoin is a terminal disease for central banks. But what you did, and it's funny that you said that thing about how you were Elvis on stage. You definitely had an Elvis moment. I'm going to pull it up. You looked at this situation. You said, oh, the ice cube on my balance sheet's melting. I'm going to buy Bitcoin. I'm even going to borrow money to buy Bitcoin. It seems almost like a speculative attack on the central bank itself. Okay, so when you asked Sailor that question, he deflected. But Max, you doubled down. You didn't let it go. If all corporations did what you guys are doing, it would seem to, to disrupt the central banks. Look which, how uncomfortable you made him feel, I might add. Which in fact <laughs> would then help Bitcoin. Is there a virtuous cycle here? Should central banks take a more politicized stance and do this for that reason as a way to get rid of possibly the greatest threat we have, and that is the central banks. And I'm tacitly having you agree with this thought, quite unfairly, <laughs> with this question. Uh, however, I think you see what I'm, I'm driving at. Is there? So again, Sailor was very conserved. <laughs> he, oh, yeah. he didn't answer directly. But uh, man, it was definitely what you said, an Elvis Presley moment. Uh, why did he held? Why did he hold himself back like that? What do you think? Uh, right. Well, it's an interesting interview uh, for many respects, because so uh, the fact is that I, I was worked on Wall Street for many years. I invented financial technology. I've been following markets for 40 years. I know all what you know, when I look at MicroStrategy and they're what they're doing, I'm looking at it from from the point of view of uh, corporate governance and SEC laws and the things that I was trained to be aware of in my career. And so I, I kind of know where the sensitive spots are. And I know that how to uh, ask a question in this case where you're going to open up potentially um, a, 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 a line of questioning that, that a, a CEO of a publicly listed company can't really addressed necessarily. So a lot of the time, so, so the whole interview for me was to ask that question and everything around it, the histrionics and everything else that went with it are there to put a frame around that question. So like I'm managing the guest, I'm the interviewer, I'm the journalist and I'm, you know, I, he's, um, he's in a position where, you know, I am running the show, you know? So, um, that's the point of the question. And I think, I'm glad to see people picked up on it in that it's a question that not necessarily he's going to be able to answer because there are certain restraints that he has in his position at that company. Um, and I've asked him the question before and um, he's there, there's clearly um, a, a reticence about direct directly answering the speculative attack question because um, it would attract potentially unwanted heat. And um, that's why there's this bit of a reluctance to take that question on head on. Because he's the highest profile public of a publicly traded company executive in Bitcoin, right? Elon is not really, a, I don't, he's such a flake. And the thing about Elon is that the reason he is a flake is that his stock prices outperform Bitcoin, if you want, you want to look at it that way for the last couple of years. I mean, Tesla stock has been a monster. So he, I can see in his mind, he's like, well, why would I even bother with this? My stock is up <laughs> more than Bitcoin, right? So and he's a bit of a freak. He's, he's, he's an anomaly. He's not, he, but, but Michael Saylor has been in that position for over 20 years. You know, he's the longest serving tech CEO in America, continuous in that job. But is he and, thinking it? Is he thinking that does he want to answer it, but he can't answer it? I, I know what he's thinking, but I know I know what he can say and what he can't say. I know that he knows that this is a speculative attack against central banks. It was confirmed by the um, actions last week where he announced a shelf offering for a billion worth of Tesla of uh, micro strategy stock that he's going to go buy more um Bitcoin. Now, what that does is it sets up the balance sheet. It, 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 his debt to equity ratio is going to get freed up so he can do more of those Bitcoin back preferreds because the balance sheet's stretched. He can't keep doing those preferreds because the debt to equity ratio would get be impaired and his rating would go down and that, you know, his credit rating and all, all that kind of stuff is impaired. So he's like, you know what? I'm just going to I'm going to increase the equity by selling stock and buying Bitcoin with my stock. And, there, and then I can go do more preferreds. 
He's creating a, a perpetual Bitcoin machine. But right? he just, and the stock went up on that news. It's dilutive. It's dilutive, and the stock that's what went I up. Said. <laughs> right? So people are like, "Wait a minute! He's creating a perpetual Bitcoin machine that's going to kill central banks." It's so and to me, it's obvious, you know. And but I, he can't say that. He can't say. <laughs> but you asked him the question the anyway. Central bank. <laughs> he can't but, say I'm targeting the central bank. I know we saw George Soros do it in '93. He killed the Bank of England, him and Stan Druckenmiller, mm -hmm. and they made a billion dollars on a day. Right. It, it's it, that that's the 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 the, game, the playbook that they're they're borrowing from. The central banks are the most leveraged piggy bank target, a pinata of profit. Mm -hmm. No one has gone after them because everyone's been borrowing money to buy back their own stock. <laughs> so they're all on the same team of we love money printing. Mm -hmm. If we're an executive and I can buy back my own stock and I just gave myself a 200 million dollar bonus. I love that. And Michael Saylor is saying, actually, I'm going to call time on this. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to call you guys out that you, you're central banks. I mean, the Fed has leveraged 70 or 80 to one. It, it's like twice the leverage of Enron before Enron blew up. He's saying, you know what? Actually, I can borrow money at half, you know, three quarters of a percent. Or I think the latest was six percent. And I'm buying an asset that's compounding at 200 percent a year. Let's say it's compounding at 100 percent a year. Now I'm going to sell equity and do the same thing. You know, these, these, I mean, the IMF, World Bank, all these banks, that, and the stock's up. I mean, he is essentially the guy, you know, he's the guy flying the Angola gay or the Enola gay that dropped the bomb in Hiroshima, essentially. He's blowing this shit up completely. And I mean, he's, no, I don't know why more people like in the financial press, like CNBC or uh, that guy, the New York Times guy on CNBC. Aaron Ross Sorkin. A Aaron Ross Sorkin. Like, you know, he's he's not, you know, he's such a dope. He's like, so I don't get it. What is it? Is it, is it <laughs> math or is, can I, my mom understand it? I, I, it's, but it's right out of the playbook of Weimar Germany. Like in the lead up to the collapse of the Reichsmark, this or the uh the yeah well that was, was the reichsmark yeah. it was reichsmark that you know th this was done by industrialists at that time they borrowed heavily and bought up assets mm -hmm. and um you know because th they saw the inflation they saw the hyperinflation coming and also you know i just was seeing that part of the reason why micro strategy stock price is soaring is like the bizarre unique way that Bitcoin on your balance sheet can help you avoid major taxes because I mean he, their average price of purchase is like twenty four thousand dollars, but he's been able to write off huge losses on his balance sheet because you have to mark it down to the lowest price it was that quarter, and then you can't mark it back up. Like even if it triples in price from here, they can't mark it up. They just have to hold it on their balance sheet as that lowest price. So. He got they got to write it off. Apparently they had some big tax write off something I was reading right before I came on here. But it's a it's a it, it interesting way to avoid having to pay taxes. Right. I mean, this is a guy who waited his whole life for Bitcoin to show up. Mm -hmm. So been like crouching tiger hidden CEO. So, Max, right? let me get let me get this straight. OK. You asked him a question you knew he couldn't answer, and you asked him again just to highlight and sh shoot a, a, a shot across the bow of central banks, essentially giving him a big middle finger. Right, and, and, and I framed it as you pro you won't be able to answer this question, or I'm, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm implicitly drawing you into making a political statement just to make sure the audience understands what's going on here mm. so that, okay, now... Now it's what what's the political statement? You know, you gotta think, okay, what's really going on here? You gotta think through it. So it's what El Salvador is 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 an incredible moment. It's the I think the and during this conversation, I think we came up with a really good a framing of it is that it's the end of that 50 year experiment that started in 1971. Because up until El Salvador, no country has had hard money. Now, El Salvador does. It's the first country in 50 years to have 
hard money backing. And now it's the beginning of the new cycle. And then the fiat money dark ages are ending. They're over. So mm -hmm. Mac Michael Saylor, the bet, you know, he, he is an engineer. He's a financial engineer. He's like, okay, I've got it. You know, the market cap of MicroStrategy before this all started was under $2 billion. You know, he was a small cap guy. I mean, they're just plugging away. And now it's worth six, seven billion, eight billion. That's going to be a fifty to sixty billion dollar company in the next year. Mm -hmm. I a hundred percent agree. But yeah, man, that's the Max. That was pretty badass. I'm not going to lie. But uh, Phil, there was a software release today. Why didn't you tell everybody about it? Software releases. Looks like we've got Spectre version one point four point five that was released, and that's down below in the show notes. Awesome. Thank you, Phil. All right, guys, before we go, I want to give a shout out to our legendary guests. They <laughs> these guys are awesome. They were uh, they were one. The Kaiser Report was a major inspiration for Simply Bitcoin. Uh, I, I got to meet them backstage. I think I scared them a little bit. So super humbling and awesome to uh, have these 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 two legends on the show. You can go follow him. You probably already follow him at Max Kaiser on Twitter. Definitely go follow Stacy Herbert, <laughs> post some awesome stuff. Uh, and of course, definitely go check out the Orange Pill Pod. We will put that link down in the link description. And of course, don't miss the fuck Elon and Mark Cuban party. party. It is J July 8th. At, uh, at the Spider House Ballroom in Austin, Texas. I already bought my tickets. It's going to be awesome. Definitely want to go to that. And uh, of course, guys, you know what to do. If you enjoyed the show, smash that like button. Smash it. And of course, if you want to continue hearing the Bitcoin news from the plip plip perspective and the catastrophic fiat and shitcoin fails, definitely consider subscribing. And we'll see you tomorrow. Hey, hey I got a question for you. Uh, you know, maybe you want to do some podcasting at the event. I would, I, whoa, that sounds like an amazing idea. <laughs> We'd be <All> right. honored. <laughs> All right, let's talk about that after we you sign off. Uh, <laughs> I'm blushing right now, but guys, we'll see you tomorrow for another episode of Simply Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs>